January 27, 1967, the United States would suffer its first major setback in the race to the moon. Astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee would crew Apollo 1. Five and a half hours into a pre-flight test, a faulty circuit along with the full oxygen atmosphere caused a fire, killing the three astronauts due to smoke inhalation in a matter of seconds. I was at the officers club covering a meeting out there late in the afternoon. And I got a call that said there's been a problem on the pad. So I rushed down to uh, NASA's public relations office. I rushed up there and I was the only reporter up there. And the word came through that, that we had lost one astronaut. Well, it was obvious in that in cold, controlled environment, 100% oxygen, if you lost one, you're gonna lose them all. But nobody wanted to say that right off the bat. But the pall that hung over this whole area for so long, um, it was just unbelievable. I think a lot of people lost their nerve in Washington, D.C. mainly, but uh, that, that was a political thing and that was overcome. Although policymakers in Washington began questioning the safety and legitimacy of such an enormous undertaking, the American public was determined to beat Russia to the moon. And after the successful manned Apollo 7 mission, the United States would finally take and never relinquish the lead over the Soviets when on December 21, 1968, Apollo 8 lifted off and carried astronauts Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders into lunar orbit. coverage of that was, was phenomenal. It was, it was the first time man had ever gone to the moon and back. Houston, uh, what does the old moon look like? 60 miles, over. Okay, uh, Houston, the moon is essentially gray. <clears throat> no color. Looks like plaster of Paris. Or uh, sort of a grayish beach sand. We can see quite a bit of detail. Uh, the sea of fertility doesn't stand out as well here as it does back on Earth. For the first time in history, we were able to look back at our planet from a distance of 240,000 miles and see how small we really are in the universe. It, it was a great period of excitement. Uh, it, it's again, we, we were the center of the Earth. We were the center of the world right down here in, in Cape Canaveral. July 16, 1969, the crew of Apollo 11, led by Commander Neil Armstrong, lifted off from Cape Canaveral, Florida. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start, 6. July 20th, the American Manned Space Program officially won the space race as Armstrong and Lunar Module pilot Buzz Aldrin landed in the Sea of Tranquility. 20 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust. Great shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds forward, just. Contact light. Houston, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. I was a young naval officer when Neil Armstrong uh, and Buzz Aldrin left their Apollo 11 command module and went down and landed on the moon. And all of the other guys in my squadron were gathered together around the commanding officer's television set that early morning as we watched the 
Uh, Houston, the Eagle has landed. Remember that famous words? And uh, we were all just as excited as anybody else around this world to watch that evolution unfold before our very eyes. And this got me that much more excited. Coming down the ladder now. I'm going to step off the limb. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I had the opportunity to be in Houston and to be in the control center during the during the landing in the public affairs booth. And uh, there was complete ex exaltation, of course, and throughout the nation, uh, you know, it's been considered one of the major, one of the major moments of the millennium by an awful lot of people. America had achieved President Kennedy's goal. And Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins were the most famous men on earth. Apollo 12 landed in the Sea of Storm on November 19, 1969. Already the task of landing on the moon and returning to Earth seemed routine. But in April of 1970, Apollo 13 would remind the country how dangerous spaceflight really was. Two days after the launch, the Apollo spacecraft was crippled by an explosion caused by a fault in the oxygen tank. The explosion damaged the service module, resulting in the loss of oxygen and electrical power. Commander Jim Lovell and crewmates Fred Hayes and Jack Swigart now had to use the lunar module as a lifeboat in space. Even Americans who had become numb to the space program now eagerly watched and waited to see if the astronauts could overcome extreme adversity. Oh, to my mind, that's the most heroic mission we had. You actually had an explosion up there. The liquid oxygen tank exploded and how they were able to nurture that all the way through, step by step, and the ingenuity that was used, it was one of the, it was a triumphant failure. It's about, all, about the only thing I can say about it. Having narrowly escaped another devastating loss of human life, Apollo 14 carried the burden of putting the American space program back on track. The stage was set for the return of Alan B. Shepard. Apollo 14 landed in the Fremora Highlands on April 5th, 1971. There was concern for the astronauts on Apollo 14 because it was following the uh, mission Apollo 13 that failed. At our house, there wasn't. Uh, NASA, there was. That fear was never ever an element or a thing, a discussion in our family. Apollo 14 would be a success, and having completed all of his requested tasks, Al Shepard became the first human to play golf on another world. He would have this in his pocket on his leg, um, on his in his spacesuit. It would just fit nicely into the little pocket, and he would pull it out and then grab onto this little handle and the whole thing would just fall and then he would shake it, they shake them into, sp into place and lock it like that and then you have this shaft that they can hook different items on the end like a shovel so they could dig up some moon dust or a probe so they could go into the moon and so because um, everything had worked well on Apollo 14, right before my father went up into the lunar module to come back to Earth, he attached this um, six iron club head on the end of the shaft. And he had a couple of golf balls that he dropped into the moon dust. And then he grabbed onto the end of the shaft. And he wasn't able to use two hands because of the spacesuit being so cumbersome, he could only use one arm and he just, he just swung it and hit the golf ball. The second one went 
for miles and miles and miles. miles, and miles. The three positions are uh, commander, command module pilot, and lunar module pilot. The commander's job on a flight basically is to fly the lunar module down to the surface and bring it back up. And the command module pilot is to fly everything out there and back. And the lunar module pilot's job is basically a systems engineer. The launch was exciting. Uh, we're all sitting in there. Uh, Dave had his hand on the abort handle. I had my hand on his hand to make sure he didn't use it, and the accelerations and the vibrations and all that. And uh, you know you're going somewhere when you're in one of those things. Apollo 15 will be the first mission to introduce the lunar rover, which allowed the astronauts to explore farther from the lunar module than previous missions. This extended exploration led to one of the most extraordinary finds on the moon to date. The Genesis rock which is a sample of the original lunar crust from the time the moon was first born. After lifting off from the moon and reuniting with the Command Module Columbia, Command Module Pilot Al Warden became the first human to perform a spacewalk in lunar orbit. Uh, the thing I had to do was recover the film cassettes from the two large cameras that I had in the back. One of them actually was about 90 pounds. It was, oh, I'd say, 30 inches in diameter and about 12 inches thick, and, and it had 1,100 feet of camera, uh, film on it. And I had to carry that canister back into the command module and stow it for re-entry. It was kind of a fun thing. You're floating. I mean, what can I say you're floating? Uh, I had a lanyard on my wrist with a hook on the end, and I hooked the handle of the canister in case I let go of it. And uh, I just walked it hand over hand, walked it back. What's funny about that is we had trained for that so much in the zero-g airplane that I was finished with what I had to do in about half the time I thought it was going to take me. And, and, and I thought, gosh, what can I do to stay out here a little longer now? Because I've done everything I'm supposed to do.